Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It's good to be back, Owen, in a slightly different and darker location today. I've seemed to have lost a few light bulbs in, in yes. the, the moves. So. Yes, you have indeed. You are recording remotely yes. I'm from down by the beach. I'm recording remotely from Sydney, up here doing a bunch of interviews and working on some education stuff. Um, well, today we're talking about managed funds and managed funds are something that we should have talked about any time over the past three years because we've had a lot of questions on them. And so this has been a long time coming. Today we're going to talk about what are managed funds, how are they different to ETFs, why you would consider investing in one, the different types, um, how much they cost and some of the things that you need to know before you invest. We might even run over like a quick checklist that will help you kind of navigate through and provide some examples of managed funds that are pretty accessible to people. Mm. So maybe to start off with Kate, let's just talk about um, why managed funds, like why is this something that's interesting to investors? Yeah, I think a lot of the time, on the, especially on the podcast and in our community, ETFs are kind of the, the topic that we talk about at the moment, even more than sh individual share investing. And I think that's because it's really simple and easy to understand and they're low cost products. But we definitely should have talked about managed funds earlier because they they've been around for quite a long time, much longer than ETFs. They've kind of got a, a bit of a bad rap over the last few years because um, there is the, miscon not misconception, because in, in cases it is true that they do underperform things like ETFs uh, over a longer period of time. And it's very hard for an active fund manager because in, instead of your ETF um, like VDHG or A200 where a human isn't selecting the individual companies. It's uh, via the benchmarks and it's a very passive strategy. With active funds, most of the time there are um, humans, analysts like Owen. Owen mm -hmm. doesn't do this, in, but he could uh, as an analyst, are actually researching companies and choosing what goes in the portfolios. And managed funds aren't, aren't just share managed funds. You can have uh, property managed funds. There's bond managed funds, even cash managed funds. If you, mm. if you really want that. So there's a lot of different options out there. So um, I think it's really good to talk about it a little bit more because they're not necessarily always a terrible product and mm. um, they have been, a lot of people are invested like billions and probably trillions yeah. of dollars in managed funds and advisors before ETFs were around, advisors would typically put, um, like financial advisors would put their clients into managed funds. So there are a lot of older Australians who do, probably have quite large positions in managed funds as well. Yeah, managed funds are massive. And they're, so let's just, let's just talk about, um, but I guess, why, um, not necessarily why you'd invest in one, but the, a managed fund is like you saying, I don't want to invest in the shares myself. I don't want to um, know when to buy and when to sell. I don't want to think about investing more than I have to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the money to a professional investor and that investor is the person that I trust to invest my money for me. In return, that investor gets a percentage of whatever's inside the fund. So it might be say 1%. And if there's $100 million from all the investors invested in that managed fund, they would take the business that they work for would take $1 million per year. And that would pay for their salaries. It would pay for their licensing, their compliance, and just offering the investment strategy. And so that's the basic mechanics of it all. Uh, and you're right, Kate, in the past, before we had ETFs as popular as they are today, almost everyone would use managed funds. The big problem, though, was that managed funds were inaccessible to a lot of people. So particularly younger people that wanted to start investing. Um, you've got to remember, it was only the past 20 years where you know, even brokerage accounts became a popular thing. Before that, you would have to see a financial advisor and the financial advisor would have a relationship with a fund manager and then they would organize for your money to be put in. You fill out paperwork and so on and so forth. And 
more recently, we found a more convenient way to invest and that is through ETFs. And you know, and I know that we just put our money in a brokerage account, we fund the brokerage account, and then we click which ETF we want to buy. But how we can close the loop here is that ETFs and managed funds are actually the same thing. It's just the way you access them that's different. So what I mean by that is inside an ETF, it's a fund, it's an exchange traded fund. A managed fund, if we just use that label, a managed fund is the same thing. It's just you access it a different way. Now there's a, and I think this is important for us, you and I to talk about because um, people send, tend to think that all ETFs are passive ETFs. And what we mean by that is they're like A200 or VDHG or um, STW or IVV or NDQ, the big ETFs, and they just track the ASX 200, the S&P 500 or whatever. There's no human involvement, as you said. But there are some ETFs that are more like traditional managed funds and they're called active ETFs, right? Maybe I can let you explain um, kind of like just basically what an active ETF is. Yeah, I think active ETFs is almost like a cross between your more traditional managed fund where you would have to apply to the fund manager and the passive ETF. So instead of um, just getting the A200 ETF where you're just getting all of the top 200 Australian companies, if you invested in an active ETF, there's still a fund manager and a company behind it that has a strategy. Mm. It might be um, it might be using the benchmark plus putting a few extra filters, or it actually might be a team that are selecting 20 companies that they think are going to outperform over the next 10 years. But often these will cost a little bit more, but it gives you a way to have an um, exposure to this particular fund manager's active strategy, which might be, uh, investing in small caps, or it might be investing in international shares that it thinks will outperform over the coming years. So it, I think it is going to become a more popular method of investing. Active ETFs will sort of start to pop up more and more. And I was, hmm. I think they only got introduced I think five to 10 years ago. They're pretty not new. Not even, I don't even think there was that long. Maybe, maybe five years ago. I think Magellan, for those of you that know Magellan Funds Management, um, they have heaps of managed funds. So you can go to their website and you can fill out the form. That's how you invest in a managed fund. You fill out the paperwork, either online or actually a form. And you send that to the fund manager, you deposit your money, and that's how you get invested. Obviously, we know ETFs are a little bit different. You just click buy or sell. It's like virtual paperwork, basically. And Magellan have actually changed many of their funds to ETFs. So you can still or like it's like an ETF structure. If you think about it like that, it's maybe not called ETF in, in from the ASX wouldn't want us just to call it a straight up ETF because of the misunderstanding. But um, that's an example of a big fund manager that said, hey, you know, instead of getting everyone to fill out this paperwork all the time, we'll just offer our fund through the ASX or through the, the CHI-X and let investors just invest for their brokerage account. And so th that's kind of like a slight digression, but active ETFs are... are are something that can be invested just like a managed fund can. It's just you access it through your brokerage account. But if we just unwind this a bit, Kate, let's go back to vanilla managed funds. We've said that the way you invest in them is you find the fund manager, you fill out the paperwork, you be pay or you direct deposit your money. Um, one of the things that we tend to get confused about, at least new investors do, is the difference between a share price and a unit price. Can you explain what a unit price is and why that's relevant for a managed fund? Yeah. So once you've selected your managed fund, you've done all the paperwork, you've showed your ID docs. So it is a little bit of a slower process to open up an account. Um, it's not going to, you can't, but you usually can't get this whole account opened within the same day because there are checks and balances they have to do. And then you have to transfer the money across. But once you have sent the money across, you've chosen the fund, the fund will uh, invest your money into that fund and you'll be allocated a unit price. So every day, uh, generally, for a managed fund, they'll calculate the unit price, which um, looks at they'll get everything underneath in that fund for the day, including the cash, and they'll total all that up and divide it across all of the different uh, units on offer. And so when you are a new investor, you'll get allocated units in that fund at that particular unit price for the day. And 
some people, I guess, try to time that and mm-hmm. send their money across on a particular day, but you, you can't always get it right because uh, sometimes the fund won't invest your money for a couple of days. And so, um, and then it happens on the same way. If you want to leave the fund or take some money out, you have to fill in an application form to withdraw money. And then on the day that your application to withdraw funds is processed, your money will be calculated based off that unit price or that mm-hmm. Price for the day. So that's probably something else um, that's a little bit tricky. There's usually a unit price, but there'll also be an entry price and an exit price. And mm. it might, um, the unit price might be a dollar, but the entry price might be a dollar. Um, what am I saying? A dollar and three cents or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to get them backwards. Um, yeah. And then the, um, so they add on a little bit of a, a fee to process because they would be having admin costs and brokerage costs for investing your money and processing that application and withdrawal. So uh, most funds you'll be able to see on their website, they'll, it might say unit price somewhere and there'll be this huge long list. Yeah. Um, and it will, will tell you what the fees are for entry and exit. So it could be, yeah, hmm. 0.03% or something like that. Yeah. So what, to, yeah. And that's, that's perfectly summed up. So, so basically if I could summarize your summary, Um, What happens is the fund manager every day calculates all of the investments that they have made. And then they say, okay, for Kate Campbell, um, she invested on this day. So the value of her investments are now worth this amount. And the way they calculate that is per unit, which makes sense. If you invest $100,000 and the unit price is $1, um, you know, uh, sorry, you get 100,000 units. But then in a year, if that's at 120,000, all of a sudden your unit is worth $1.20. So if you only wanted to sell 10 of those or 50 or 50,000, you could do that uh, without having to sell the whole thing. And that's the point of a unit price. And the name actually comes from a unit trust, which is basically just a way that money is held for you and it's broken down into individual units. And that's a type of legal structure that most trusts um, and most ETFs and funds kind of use that kind of structure, um, which we'll get to in a moment when it comes to taxes, why that's important. And so, Kate, there are two types of fees that people typically pay in a managed fund. And this is automatically taken out. So you don't have to sign a, you know, get out your checkbook or, or send in some money for this. This is a fee that these, both of these fees automatically come out of the unit price. So can you explain what the two fees are for managed funds? Yeah. So the first fee that ETF investors are probably quite familiar with is the management fee. And that's the cost for running the fund, for paying the staff, for doing all of the day-to-day admin. Now for a managed fund, that's probably going to be on the higher side. So let's say 1% per mm-hmm. year is your management fee. So um, I'm not good at maths on the spot, but if you had $10,000 in a managed invested in a managed fund at 1% per year management fee, that would be, Owen? About a hundred bucks. Okay. And then if you had invested in, um, what are we saying? Like A200, which is the only one I can remember right now, which is 0.07%. Yep. That is about $70, $70? $7. Yeah, it's a lot less. Oh gosh. Yeah. So you can see it's significantly different with a $10,000 balance per year. And obviously if you're going to be invested over a 10 year time frame, that does add up over time, which is why you do have to be careful of the fees. So Um, When you read the product disclosure statement or you're just looking at the website for either an ETF or a managed fund, look for what's called the management fee and that will tell you what they're going to charge each year. And yep, as Owen said, they don't send you a bill. It all just happens automatically. And when you get your statement at the end of the year, um, they do send you a, a fee statement which tells you what's been taken out during the year. And then the other fund, which is a little bit different to ETFs, is a performance fee. And yep. a, I'd say most managed funds charge a performance fee. Most um, act like properly active funds charge uh, a performance fee. And like not all of them, it's, it, it, they don't have to. Some people are against performance fees and some people are pro performance fees. Maybe I'll ex- you can explain why, what they are and then we can dive into that. Yeah. So performance fee really rewards the fund management team for doing their job better than they were supposed to do it. Like it's, yeah. they're getting paid to do their job really well. It's just think of like a bonus at the end of the year, if your company's mm-hmm. done really well and they're really happy with all the staff performance and they've had heaps of customers and heaps of revenue, they might give everyone a bonus. So with a um, active managed fund, if they, they're, 
benchmark was the ASX 200. Like say that was, um, I don't know, numbers, uh, 7% benchmark for this financial year. Um, and this fund performed and it did 20% returns. And so this exceeded the benchmark. So the fund gets to choose the benchmark as well, what it aims to track. And so if the fund um, does really well, um, they have great returns for investors and they well and truly top their benchmark, then they may be able to charge if they've written it up front in the product disclosure statement, a performance fee. So they get rewarded for doing really well with your money. So you get the extra performance, but they get to take a cut of that as well. Yeah. And so this is where fund managers can make a lot of money. Um, this is how they buy the boats. This is how they get the yachts. Yeah. Um, so, and th- you know, I just, you, t- you said there that typically nowadays it's pretty common for a fund manager of a managed fund to charge 1%. There are some ETFs that charge more than that, by the way, but an yeah, index Yeah, some fund, of those thematic ones we looked yeah, at. Yeah, yeah. They, charge a, they charge a hefty amount, but um, the, the managed funds typically charge 1% today. They used to charge something called 2 and 20. And this is an old hedge fund thing, um, which is a type of managed fund. Um, and two and 20 effectively mean we'll charge you 2% per year in a management fee and we'll take 20% of the outperformance. And as you can imagine, you know, those old school Wolf of Wall Street kind of um, the Wall Street movies, almost all of them ha- feature hedge fund managers who did this type of thing. And one of the things that they could do is they could say, oh, we've got $100 million invested and we're going to charge 2%. So we're going to collect $2 million for our business, regardless of how Whether we you, perform. Yeah. Even if you do really badly that year and you underperform. Yeah, we're going to take the money yeah. um, every day, automatically taken out. And you barely notice it because it's only a small percentage and it comes out every day. And then the other thing that they would do is they would shoot the lights out one year. So one year they would do really well. And you think, wow, this is great performance. But they would be taking 20% of the, that out performance. And so they would be getting filthy rich based on that. And the next year they could do horribly, like they could just go straight down the gurgler with their performance, but they don't really care because they just made a huge amount of performance fees. And they're like, you know, we made so much money last year. We're happy for it to kind of come back to earth this year. But you as an investor, you're like, well, I, you know, I want to keep, you know, you to perform, right? And um, there is a thing that was introduced um, quite a few years ago called a high watermark. And as you can imagine, if you're at the, the jetty or the pier and you see the water going up and down on the posts on the holding up the jetty or pier, um, the high watermark is basically saying our fund and how we perform, when we get to that high watermark, only from that point up can we charge a performance fee. So if we do really well this year and we charge you a fee, but then next year it falls back down and we do well, we're not going to charge you a performance fee down there. We have to get back above that original level before we can do that. There are some more innovative funds in Australia that have even more kind of, I guess, honest uh, performance measurement. And some of those funds, for example, say we won't charge management fees unless we are returning a certain amount. So that even is that adds more desperation for the fund manager because they're like, well, if we, if we don't perform at all, we're not going to get any money, not even management fees. So they're pretty rare, those types of fund managers, because none of them want to take that risk, but they, some of them do exist. There are other fund managers, and this is a final thing that I'll add. There are other fund managers who have said, we're not going to track a benchmark. We're just going to say we want to perform at 10% per year, for oh, example. The old benchmark unaware fund. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So they just say, we're going to try and achieve 10% per year. So to keep it really simple, and then that way you're not left guessing about what our performance fee might be, what our you know what our target is. We're just going to say ten percent a year. That's it. That's what we're going for. Mm-hmm. And you know, some just be really careful if someone promises you more than say ten percent. That would be, I'd start to raise my eyebrows beyond that. Like if they're saying we're going to go 12, 15, 20 percent a year, I'd be like, whoa, okay, what's going on here? Because the reality is that's very, very rare for them to achieve that over a long period of time. So. Yeah most of the good ones charge, they say, we're going to target eight to 10% or something or seven to 10% in that range. And that's pretty common too. Yeah. I guess the good important thing to sort of differentiate there is sometimes the marketing material might say we're targeting 7% returns for investors per year. And I good see point. this a lot with property related funds oh, yeah. because they're, they can kind of guesstimate their rental income a little bit more. Um, but that's, that's the marketing material. You really need to go and see what the product disclosure statement says is the official benchmark and what they are targeting because they might 
say a nice thing on the cover, but it might not be what they're actually doing, or they might have a much right. lower um, benchmark in there. And I think that's manage funds. It's even more important to read the product disclosure statement because they can do uh, some different things that ETFs might not necessarily do. And because with an ETF, if you want to, if I want to sell my units in my ETF today, I can just what it's past 10 o'clock. I can go into my brokerage account right now and place a sell order and I can mm. have the funds in the next three days. But with a managed fund, they might have um, capped withdrawals. So they might only let you take, this is not all of them, but they might only let you take a certain amount out each quarter, or you have to have your um, withdrawal application in by a certain date for it to be processed. So they might mm. not do daily redemptions. Um, they might do monthly or quarterly. So there's a few little niche things that you should know about there. And also um, most of them will have a minimum investment account amount. So you might have to invest five grand or 25 grand to get started. And then they might have a minimum additional investment. So you can't just put $5 in when you feel like it. It might have to be an additional thousand dollars or $10,000. And the same on withdrawing funds from that. So they might only let you take a minimum of $5,000 out at a time. So there is a little bit less flexibility there when it comes to that. You can't just go straight into your brokerage account, um, which is, I guess, one of the benefits of those active is, ETFs. Yeah. Like you mentioned with Magellan, when they're bringing their, their active strategy onto the, the ASX, so you can just buy and sell it on the same day. Yep. It makes yeah. it a lot easier. Yeah, and... and um... Some of the some of the funds choose to list. Oh, this is a bit complicated, but some of the funds are on the Chiex, which is this like the and the different type of um, stock exchange here in Australia. It's if you use Comsec, you can access it the same way. You wouldn't know, but um, the basic idea of ETFs is just to make that buying and selling process easier. But let's say, for example, I'm I'm glad you brought up property managed funds. I'm always to be honest, I'm always very skeptical of property managed funds. I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm just saying that I'm skeptical. And I'm very skeptical of small providers of property managed funds. I would say be very skeptical. That's healthy to be very skeptical. Um, not cynical or anything like that, just skeptical. Because as you said, Kate, um, the things that you want to see are things that you know make it easier for you and are really transparent. If the fund manager says, comes out with a marketing document and they say, hey, look at this tremendous managed fund. Um, we're targeting 10% returns per year. But then you go into the PDS and it says, um, our benchmark is is inflation, as in all we have to do is beat inflation. Um, that creates a big mismatch. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're a, you want to invest in a managed fund that invests in the share market. As we know, the share market should, you know, it's not a guarantee, but it should go up somewhere between, you know, four and 10% per year on average over the next 10 years, say. This is a, is a guess, right? But if the fund manager says we're going to charge a performance fee for anything above inflation, which is like one and a half percent, two percent, whatever, then they're just going to make so much money off of your money because all they have to do is basically do nothing yeah. and, they, and they can make a performance fee. So you've got to make sure that the performance fee matches um, what's actually, you know, uh, marketed to you. And the other thing is, and just circling back to the property stuff, is it's hard to sometimes mark the unit price to get that unit price for property, because sometimes that relies on valuations that may not necessarily be always accurate. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to be mindful of those two. So that's why I say go with, a, if you're going to think about different types of things inside a managed fund, go with reputable providers for those types of things. For shares, mm -hmm. you know, most of them are pretty reputable if they've got an AFSL and, and whatever. Um, so yeah, can, that's just, sorry, go. yeah, just on that, like thinking, just thinking logically about what's in that managed fund and going, because um, that will sort of dictate a lot of that withdrawal timeframes and how easy it is to get your money in and out. Because if you're investing in big office buildings, if all the investors want their money at once, they can't just sell that office building immediately. And yeah. even with um, some small, smaller companies, if a lot of investors want their money out at once, that can sometimes be a little bit more difficult because some of these companies are illiquid. So if you're investing in like large international managed funds um, or large Australian managed funds, that's often a lot easier to get your money in and out on a yeah. speedy basis. So just I, thinking, yeah, a bit logically about what you're actually investing in and how easy it is for that managed fund manager to get the money in and out of that asset. And this is why when you look at ETFs, you see most of the ETFs are invested in shares. So not mm. all of the ETFs invest in shares, but most of them do. 
And the reason for that is that the fund manager can quickly go and buy and sell all the shares inside the ETF if, they, if you need your money back. Whereas say, you don't see many property ETFs because you'd have to sell a property in order to give the investors their money back. And that's why you don't see that. So that's why if you look on the ASX, most of the ETFs are pretty liquid, like meaning that you can get in and out pretty seamlessly and then typically at a good price. Um, Kate, so just, you know, um, I think just people are probably asking us like, this is pretty confusing. There's a lot of information here. Why would I, just in summary, why would I or you or anyone invest in a managed fund over an ETF? Yeah, so I think that links back to what we just said, but it does give you specific exposure to different asset classes that you might not be able to invest in otherwise. So if you do want to invest in um, certain emerging markets, or if you want to invest in foreign bonds or a specific com- country, or you want to invest in office buildings, uh, and you want an expert team, well, hopefully you can check them out, you can read their bio, um, you can use a managed fund to do that. And because you, you might not be able to get exposure to this specific asset class that you want through an exchange trader fund or something a little bit more simpler. Uh, there also might be a specific fund manager. And so um, you might have heard like of Magellan or Platinum and you might go, oh, I really love that fund manager and that management team and that portfolio manager. And I'm just going to go into this managed fund because I, I like their investment style. So mm. some people do it based off that. And also you might be potentially wanting to outperform the benchmark through active management. And so I'd really recommend if you're sort of thinking about that, looking at their long-term performance, not just one year because a lot of funds have had a good year. Um, and really looking, you can look at the reports and everything like that, see what kind of companies they actually invest in. They'll often disclose their top five or top 10 holdings. You can even, if you read their monthly or quarterly reports, you can sort of get an understanding of why they choose the companies they do. Or I guess if it's office buildings, uh, they might have some sort of valuation report or something there that you can have a look at. Yeah. And this is, even if you just, you don't invest in managed funds, I think it's really valuable just to go and read the fund managers. Um, are required to tell you what they're invested in and how they've performed. They don't have to tell you everything. Unlike an ETF, which is publicly available on an ETF provider's website, you can go in and you can click view all holdings. So if you're invested in say the VAS ETF, the Vanguard VAS ETF, you can go on the Vanguard website and say view holdings. And then you can see a full list of all 300 or thereabouts companies. The fund managers don't have to go to that level of disclosure. So it's not as transparent, but they typically will say, these are our top 10 positions or these are the regions that we're invested in and here's why. And just reading those letters and those monthly or quarterly reports is so valuable for people. Um, it's particularly if you're invested in one of these funds. Like if you're invested in Magellan, you should be reading the quarterly report because this is the this is the person, these are the people that are investing your money and they're telling you why they're doing certain things. Whereas a lot of investors, and not just in managed funds, but in most things tend to just go, oh, my shares are down 10%, therefore I must sell. But if you... Like if you think about it, you wouldn't want to sell necessarily if it's down 10%. They've said, hey, we knew this was going to happen. We told you this was going to happen. And now is the time to invest more, not less. And this goes to back to the point of, which we kind of didn't cover at the top of the show, but a lot of fund managers cop a lot of criticism because they underperform versus you know a benchmark. You mentioned like A200 versus say an active fund manager. Um, and so A200 in that example would be the passive ETF and the fund manager would be the active side of that. So most reports show that on average, the active fund managers underperform the, the passive uh, portfolios and ETFs. But um, what the, the reports also show is that people that chase returns tend to do worst. So if you invest in, oh, you go, you go, oh, my, my, my fund manager's down 10% this year, but that one's up 20%. I'm going to go with that one. Well, the studies seem to show that that's the worst possible thing that you can do. And so one thing that I often say is when you invest in anything, so whether you, you know, you invest in, you're a member of our services or you invest in a super fund or you invest in a managed fund or an ETF, you, what you're paying for is you're paying for the process of that investor or that investment product. So what are they doing and what are they doing repeatedly? That's what you're getting. You're not getting what happened in the past. That just gives you some sort of insight into how they've done in the past, but that might not happen in the future, which is why we have the warnings. 
So make sure you read the letters, make sure you understand what you're investing in and how they're doing it. I think that's just a good exercise, even if you don't have five or 10 or $20,000 to invest right now. Um, Kate, just quickly here, we've got some things that we want to talk about in the end. Um, how do you invest in a managed fund? I think we covered yeah. it, but just succinctly, how do you invest in a managed fund? Yeah. So if you find a managed fund that you like, they'll have a, if it is a retail managed fund, um, I don't want to go into it today, but there are many wholesale managed funds where you have to fulfill a certain amount of tests that even Owen and I don't fulfill. So we can't mm. invest in them. But um, if you want to invest in a retail managed fund, it might say minimum $5,000. And if you're happy with all of the details, you've read the product disclosure statement, there'll be some sort of button that says invest now. Or if it's a bit more old school, you might have to fill on a form. Um, you'll have to provide ID documents, send the money across and that's about it. And then you'll just have to keep it in mind um, if there's a distribution um, at the end of the year, because that'll have to go into your um, tax return. But you can choose often to reinvest that distribution of the managed fund, which is if you are trying to invest over a long period of time and um, build your investment, that can often be a good idea. So let's say you want to invest Kate, in something like Magellan, Forager, Australian Ethical, like there's a heap of list of names we'll just get to in a minute. But let's say you want to invest in one of these fund managers, uh, they manage funds, and you're like, I want long-term growth from these fund managers, but then you receive a distribution. And that's like a dividend from a managed fund. Why am I required to, to do that? Is there any reason that you can think of? Otherwise, I can I can riff on this. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure because they the unit trust structure, they have to pay out their their um, capital gains to investors. They can't just keep it in that fund forever. Uh, so they do pay most of the, the gains in the fund out as a distribution, which um, so you might see really significant distributions in years of really strong performance. So the fund has sold some of their high performing positions. And so um, at, at that case, you might actually see most of your return actually paid out as a distribution. So if you don't reinvest it, you might end up with a very similar starting balance at the end of 10 years um, if you keep getting that money paid out to you in cash. Yeah, so, and this comes back to what we talked about, about the unit structure. If you invest with a managed fund, typically you're not giving them your money for like for them to own. It's not your, like you're not just gifting them money. That's still your money being invested on your behalf. So you're a beneficial owner. So, um, or you're the rightful owner as well. So what happens is, they invest it for you basically on trust and you are responsible for the money that's generated because it's your money. So you still need to put that into your tax return. So the ATO says, hey, if you invest in that, you still need to record if you have um, made any income, if you've made short-term capital gains, long-term capital gains, that's your money. So you need to record that. And so the fund manager says, okay, well, we've got to distribute that out. Um, and that's why Kate says here that it's really interesting. You can do um, a distribution reinvestment plan. It's like a DRP for shares, the same thing, dividend reinvestment plan, distribution reinvestment plan. You can go to the fund manager's website typically, or the, can you do that via share registry as well? Like how did you do, um, set up yours? Yeah, so my the fund I have invested in uses a sort of a, a registry, yep. um, a fund registry, and so you just go through that. Though I think actually some of them are still pretty old school I might have had to tick a box on a form um, yeah. because they do some of them do have the option where you can reinvest 50% of the distribution mm. and you can have 50% paid out so for a lot of um, investors closer to retirement they actually may want some of that cash um, so you can also change that you just have to make sure I with the lead times a bit longer. So if you know it's 30 days before the next distribution is getting paid, then maybe think about changing your settings then mm. because uh, there is a longer lead time for all of this stuff. And all this information is included in the PDS, the product disclosure statement. And oftentimes you have to read that in order to fill out the form anyway. So um, the, the thing to keep in mind here is that if you are investing for the long term, you still need to record you know, your taxable income, your taxable gains. Uh, just like you would if you had an ETF, you know, you get that statement at the end of the year, it's the same thing. The way you check um, how often a fund pays out its distributions is you go to the website and you go to the, pro the fund page, basically, and it shows you, um, we pay out our distributions annually or semi-annually, which means half yearly or quarterly, depending on the type of managed fund. Kate, real quick, we want to go through two final things. One of them is 
just a really brief selection criteria for picking a managed fund and just some examples of funds. So they're just strictly examples for you to go out there and, and, and just see what managed funds are and how they differ to ETFs. So firstly, Kate, let's just talk about some very high level stuff that you could do if you're looking at picking, a, if you're thinking of picking a managed fund and investing, say, you know, 10 or $20,000, $25,000, whatever, what are some things that we could, we could do? Uh, I'd check if the investment amount is and if it's a retail managed fund because it might just be completely out of reach for me. Um, there's a lot of retail managed funds with a $25,000 minimum investment amount, which for me um, would probably be a lot, um, a bit too much in mm. any one thing. So um, that would probably turn me off straight away. But there are managed funds with much lower investment amounts, which we'll get into. The next thing, if, if say, that was a reasonable minimum investment amount, I was comfortable with that. I would definitely look at some of the team. So I'd look at who the portfolio manager is, some of their key uh, staff members and look at the, what have they been doing over the last the rest, last of, rest of their career? Mm -hmm. um, have they been do, running other successful managed funds? Have they, um, can I read some of their blog posts? Can I read their fund management reports? Can I get an idea of the way they invest? Can I watch uh, one of their webinars? Like most of these funds the portfolio manager will go off um, on the speaking tour at least once a year and there'll be podcasts or webinars or something online that you can find out more about them and their style. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that's fantastic. So we've got, is it a retail fund? So then that means that the minimums will be lower and you can actually invest and you don't have to be like a, a big, big shot investor or have a lot of money. Um, find out who's running the fund. I think that's really very great. You know, I do the, for the Australian Investors Podcast, um, you can go on there and you can see some of the interviews that I've done with fund managers. There's many of them on there. Um, and you can see what we talk about, how they invest, how they think. Let's try and find all of that. Read the literature around that. Uh, then we can look at things like um, how the fund has performed. If you go onto websites, um, you know, like their website, you can see how is the fund perform over a long period of time. Just be mindful that you don't want to look at one year returns. Please do not look at anything shorter than three years. Like, I don't just say this stuff to, to like be compliant with the law. This is actually a legitimate thing. If you're investing for the long-term, study the long-term results, not the short-term. Because you might look at one of these fund managers, you might go, oh, they've, they've done really well over the last 12 months. And then really not carefully think that the last 12 months has been an outstanding year for certain types of investors, but not for others. And so that might not be the same next year. So long-term, um, one thing on that, Kate touched on the benchmark. Make sure you know what the benchmark is. So like, what are they track? What are they trying to outperform? And, and look at the long-term performance of that particular benchmark as well. Exactly. I, the first thing I go to when I look at a managed fund is since inception returns. So this is like an annual figure, typically. It'll be like, say, 12%, 9%, whatever. And then they'll, in the next column, they'll have since inception for the benchmark. That's the first thing I go for. Then I go 10 year, then I go five year, then I go three year. And I don't even look at anything less than that unless I'm just trying yeah. to figure out how I'm stressed out the fund manager is right now. Um, but yeah, I just, I just mentioned always look at the since inception date because some of these funds have only been around for one or two years. So you might think you're looking at this really long period of time, but it's actually only since inception was uh, since 2019. Yeah, that's it. So um, typically for financial advisors, they don't invest in a managed fund. This is not all financial advisors, but typically they won't invest in a managed fund unless it's been around for at least three years because they know, the financial advisors know that three years is kind of the minimum. If, if the fund manager makes it to three years, that's like a, a tick of approval for that fund manager because some of them don't make it that long, even if they have decent performance. Uh, the third thing, or the, the next thing that we've got here is the size of the fund. So we're going to just list some names here of pretty big, fund managers, there are many small fund managers that we call boutique fund managers. So let's say, for example, there was the Kate Campbell and Owen Rask fund, and we wanted to launch it today. Um, but we're not part of Magellan and we're not part of AMP and we're not part of these big names. We just want to go and invest our money together and we want to allow other people to join us. We would be called a boutique fund manager. And typically a boutique fund manager is smaller. It only has like one or two, you know, strategies. Um, and so if you're new to investing, I would say maybe start with the, the names that have been around for a while, just so you're, you're comfortable with that process before you go and try and pick one out like a needle in a haystack. Um, and they will disclose this, won't they, Kate? They'll disclose how much money they have invested in their funds yeah. on, on their website, hopefully. 
Yeah. So looking for funds under management is important. Um, there are some funds that managed to stay alive for quite a long time with maybe only $10 million under management. And you just need to think about how is the fund sustainable long term? Is it likely to close? Can they afford to keep? Because you kind of want good analysts and good portfolio manager that's running the fund. So can they afford to pay them based off the management fee and the funds under management? So yeah. that's something to have a look at as well. That's so often called the FUM, FUM. So if we, Kate and I ever say FUM, that's what we mean, funds under management. So there's no really hard and fast rule here, but if you go into the, if you look at all of the different managed funds that the, the provider has, um, you could go into the monthly updates or the quarterly updates and somewhere in a table is typically FUM. If they're not disclosing FUM, like the number, um, it means it's probably not that big. And I typically want to see that over 100 million. That's not like a hard and fast rule. It's just like, I typically want to see it over that. Because if you think about it, if you've got $100 million and you're charging 1%, um, that means your business is earning $1 million. And that it's, it's a lot of money to you and I, Kate, but if you're a fund manager, you've got to pay yourself, you've got to pay maybe two or three analysts, you've got to pay um, a marketing coordinator, someone that deals with clients, like all of a sudden that's gone and you've got all the usual costs like offices and that sort of stuff. Um, so you want to make sure they're sustainable. And finally, just on this, just compare like for like ETFs, I'm sorry, not ETFs, uh, managed funds. So you want to compare um, like if you look at Magellan, maybe compare that to Forager, compare it to Platinum, compare it to insert name of any other you know, global fund. Um, look at all these different fund managers side by side and then say, okay, the fees on this one are this, the long-term performance is that. I think this about the, the fund manager. The um, I like these companies that this fund manager has invested in and not so much this one. And weigh, weigh them up um, side by side. Okay, okay. Last thing. Um, just some examples of managed funds with low fees. So not all of us have 20, uh, not low fees, of um, low fu uh, low <laughs> minimums. That's what I'm yeah. trying to get to. Um, so just some, can you give us some examples of managed funds that might be able to take less than say $20,000? If I've only got you know $30,000, I don't want to put it all in one managed fund. So I want to kind of spread it across a few. What are some examples or places that I can look just to get started on that kind of research journey? Now, I looked these up a few weeks ago, so hopefully none of them have changed their minimum investment amounts since then, and I haven't really looked into all of their performance, so I'm just telling you these names based off minimum investment amounts, but some include Forager, Platinum, Australian Ethical, Platypus, BT, Pengana, and Benelong, and they've got, a lot of these do have multiple funds, but a couple of them do have minimum investment amounts that are less than 25000 so that could be something to have a look at. Um, and I, I think managed funds do do have a place and they can have a role in your portfolio. But I mean, it wouldn't be something I put all of my money in, but it might be something you put some of your money in um, for a particular asset class or an exposure that you really want. I think, yeah, I think once you get to say $50,000, $100,000 of investable money, it's, it's for some people that sounds like a long way away, but it tends to creep up on you quicker than you expect. You tend to get to that level and then you think, okay, I love my ETFs um, and for sure they're great. And I, I, I like my individual stocks as well, but maybe I'll just try these managed fund things. And some people do like to do that. Um, they do like to move into this. Um, I think, you know, by the time I go into the dirt, I will have invested in a lot of managed funds myself. And the mm. reason is sometimes you come across investors and you're like, wow, they are impressive people. Yes, I know that many managed funds underperform, but I think that this person is an impressive investor. So I'm going to give them a little bit of my money to invest for me. And um, that's, that's reasonable. Just follow the checks and balances, make sure they've got an AFSL, they issue a PDS, all of those things that we would normally suggest. Um, and, and go out and, and learn about these interesting investors and these interesting companies that they're buying for you or bonds or whatever. Um, Kate, I know that you have some investments in, um, in managed funds. I don't have yeah. any. I don't have any currently, but I do have ETFs that um, do something similar. How do you just one final question on this? Is how do you treat your managed fund positions? Do you think of them as core positions, or do you think of them as like those satellite, those smaller positions around the outside? I think for the particular managed funds, because they're not too niche, they are international managed funds. Because I at the time, like this is going back a few years. One was I started in twenty seventeen. I did all my research. I liked the team and I wanted exposure to the international market. I didn't know that much about ETFs at the time, but I did like their approach and everything like that. And they did allow me to 
set up a regular contribution plan. So every month I was able to, they mm -hmm. direct debited $200, which I think was the minimum at the time. And so this is slowly, it built up from $1,000 with a 200 regular contribution plan. I stopped it at some times when I couldn't afford it. Um, I restarted it. So you can do things like that. I reinvested the distributions and it's just slowly been growing over time. But I don't know, I don't probably part of the core I don't think it is as speculative as some of the small cap investments or other things I've made so yeah I'd probably say it's the core of my portfolio but it would really depend what it's investing in I agree totally I think if it's like a very kind of established managed fund I think it can it can find a place in the core like for that long term steady as she goes hold it in there um, for the more exotic managed funds and there are heaps of them by the way like maybe even small cap um, manage funds or um, fund managers that do weird and wonderful things, they would maybe be in the, the satellite for me. But I just mm. think it's what you're comfortable with. If you're comfortable to own something and back an investment for five or 10 years, that's probably where it sits in that core position, um, that bottom draw. But if, if it's a bit more you know, exotic, maybe push it out into the satellite and, and keep a closer watch on it and just mm. you know, regularly check in with it because you might find that you got it wrong and it's okay to move on then. So just to just to wrap up, Kate, did you want to just give us a, you know, like a maybe like a 60 second wrap up of this episode? Yeah. So I think we introduced managed funds, um, how they could be used as part of your portfolio that maybe they do underperform, but not necessarily. And they can give you exposure to certain asset classes. Uh, when you invest in a managed fund, you'll be um, you get a unit price depending on the day you invest in and you'll get units in the fund. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to look at at the website, especially reading the product disclosure statement to find out the minimum investment amounts, how you apply for units in the fund and how you withdraw units in the fund, which I think is probably the more important one. Yeah. Um, finding out how it's managed finding out the team, um, even things, words you've heard before, like custodian, finding out where the money's held because the fund manager, it's not all in their individual bank account. So mm -hmm. they'll have their company bank account and they'll also have the funds um, usually under a different um, bank account. So they'll have a custodian overseeing the funds, um, looking at the team um, and even just yeah, doing your research, even just for fun, reading some of these reports, even if you're never going to invest in managed funds, just to get us. Um, an insight into how other people invest. And I know a lot of our analysts do read these managed fund reports, even if they have nothing to do with that managed fund, just to get an insight into the companies they're looking at. And sometimes you can get a sneak peek into some particular stocks that you might be interested. Mm, yeah, I find them fascinating to read. I, I, I have a certain number of fund managers, about five of them that I just love and I just follow them religiously. Uh, just to confirm um, or just to summarize the little checklist that we had here, um, you want it to be a retail fund. So it needs to be open to retail investors. That would be, that would mean it has a PDS and you can see that on the website. Um, watch, watch some interviews with the staff members or read their, their letters to get familiar with them. Typically they're often on social media like LinkedIn or um, Twitter and those types of things. Um, look at the long-term returns and the long-term risk of the, the fund. You can find that in the monthly or quarterly reports or on the website, paying attention to the benchmark. Some fund managers omit their benchmark from their, their fancy charts and everything. Make sure you look at the benchmark. Um, number th the, the, the fourth thing would be the size of the, the issuer, um, the, the size of the fund manager. Maybe start with a more established provider. You can always go into boutique or smaller funds later if you're comfortable. Um, and the final thing would be just compare apples to apples. Don't go and compare you know, a Magellan to then a bond fund manager, or don't compare Australian ethical to a property fund. Um, compare similar fund managers in the industry uh, to look at fees, performance, the team, all that sort of stuff and see what you're comfortable with. Um, so that's that's that, Kate. Of course, you can learn more about investing on our on our RASC education website. We've just crossed 11,000 students. It's crazy. It's huge. It's wonderful. We are on a mission with this and we have more courses in the works. Um, there are more and more coming and we want to keep serving you and helping you invest. So go check out our ETF and share investing courses. If you're new to investing, they provide a great primer on what is the stock market and how you can get involved. Um, and of course, we have our memberships. If you want to learn more about ETFs and, and um, see what we're investing in, uh, you can join Rask ETFs or Rask Invest. And of course, our free Facebook community, um, totally free. We just love to hear from you. We occasionally post videos, comments and, and such in there. And it's a great thriving community. If you've invested in managed funds, personally, I'd love to know which funds you're invested in and why. Because when we do, sit down and do this podcast, Kate, we kind of just pick a, a, a bunch of fund managers in this instance. And we think, 
this might be an interesting list of things for our community to, to get excited about, but they might be excited about something totally different. So if, if someone else in the community has an idea, any of us can go in there and, and learn from, from you. So please jump into the community, say g'day, tell us what you're invested in and why, and we'd love to hear from you. Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening.